thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for coming to uh, another lecture. Um, so this is going to be an interesting one. I actually spent quite a lot of time preparing this lecture for you uh, because this is a very important topic. And the topic is going to be our probably most mathy topic that's going to be transformations. And this is a very, very fundamental thing. I'm calling it mathy, but it's not that heavy on the math. We're going to deal with vectors and matrices, uh, but we're not going to do complicated stuff with vectors and matrices. We're going to do very, very basic, simple stuff with vectors and matrices. And that's the that's really core math requirement for, uh, for, for graphics, really. Some, some graphics stuff will require more math, but when you look at the entirety of graphics, the, the core part that's shared with everyone, it's going to involve this much math that we're going to go over today. It's going to be about transformations. So what is transformation, right? So uh, imagine that I have, whoa, a scene like this, right? Uh, so how, how would you build something like this in reality, right? So, you know, you, you, let's say you have this yard, um, you're gonna, you know, put some tables and chairs, right? So, you know, you buy your tables and your chairs and, and whatever else you wanna put on the tables and you, you, you carry them and you put them wherever you want them, right? This is how we do it in reality. So the way we're gonna do it in computer graphics is not gonna be very different, actually. So all these um, assets, we call them, these, these models, these um, chair model or table model or anything else you see like trees and whatever, they're going to be modeled separately somewhere, right? And then we're going to put them in our scene and we're going to place them wherever we want, right? We're going to move them, we're going to orient, the, uh, orient them however we like. Maybe we're, we're going to duplicate them as many times as we want so we can have multiple chairs or multiple tables. Um, so and all of this stuff, we're going to do this mathematically using transformations. That's why transformation is a very, very fundamental operation for, for computer graphics. Right? This is how we are going to be building our, our data that we're going to be dealing with. All right? So uh, the, the kind of transformations that we're going to be talking about today are specifically affine transformations. So those of you uh, who heard about affine transformations should be familiar with, with what those are. So there is translation. Uh, that's just moving something, right? Um, there is rotation. Um, that's another affine transformation. That you know, rotation. Uh, there's scale is another affine transformation. Um, and when people talk about affine transformations, they also talk about oftentimes skew. Like when I ask this in in my classes, at least one person will say, "Oh, there's also skew." Yes, there's skew, and skew looks something like this. Um, but I don't quite like talking about affine transformations and including skew in them because skew is actually a combination of rotation and scale. And here's how it works. You start with a rotation and then you apply some non-uniform scale and then you rotate it back and that becomes skew. So skew is not really a new thing. It's just a combination of rotation and scale. That's why I, when I think about affine transformations, these are what I mean. Uh, specifically speaking, uh, you'll see that rotation and scale are linear transformations. When we add translation to it, that becomes um, the set of affine transformations. Now, these are the simplest transformations we can have. That's why we're talking about them. So you can basically, you know, maybe take um, a chair model and you can bend it <laughs> in some weird ways. That's going to, that's not going to be an affine transformation. That's going to be a, you know, nonlinear transformation. So these affine transformations are going to be, uh, sort of linear in the sense that they're going to preserve lines and they're going to preserve the, the, the parallel uh, lines as, as parallel. So all lines after these transformations will remain as lines and all parallel lines will remain as parallel lines after these transformations. So basically, this is the set of easiest transformations we can do. And these are the kind of transformations that we're going to be using very, very frequently for all sorts of operations in computer graphics. Uh, we're going to be using them for building our scenes. We're also going to be using them for rendering. And we're going to talk about that next time. All right. So uh, let's start talking about them. Well, I would like to talk about them in the context of 2D graphics first. So we're going to talk about 2D affine transformations today, and next time we're going to talk about how to extend them to 3D. And it's not going to be hard. 
so I would like to talk about all the details and all the complicated stuff in 2D. Right, let's start. The sample is one. Translation. All right, just moving some stuff, right? So um, it's, a, it's a good idea to think about these in the context of vectors. So I have this coordinate frame, of course. I can't have a vector without a coordinate frame. I have a coordinate frame and I have a vector, right? Um, so what I would like to do is translate that vector. So what does that mean? I'm going to take this, this position and move it somewhere else. So I'm going to get a new vector like this. So I started with, let's say, vector p and p prime over here is the resulting vector after translation operation. So basically what happened here is that I uh, move that position by adding another vector to it. So if I write it, write this as a vector math, it's going to look like my, my resulting vector is my input vector plus some translation vector, whatever that is. Right? And if you look at the vector components in 2D, of course, x and y components are going to be just, you know, I'm just adding the translation uh, vector to my original vector, and this is it. So very, very simple math, right? Super simple. Translation is super easy, you think. Yes, it is super easy. So let's move on to scale. Um, in scale, I'm going to just uh, you know, move things, make things larger or smaller. We can't do that in reality, but in computer graphics, that's very easy to do, so we're going to do that. Uh, so let's see that this is, let's say that this is our initial vector, and when I scale it, it's just going to grow, right? So this was my initial vector, and I scaled it to this, this larger vector, right? And so this is not going to change direction if I do uniform scale. So if I'm scaling both x and y directions the same amount, then it's not going to change its direction. So I can write the output vector, um, p prime, as some scalar multiple of my input vector, right? Simple stuff. So again, if I look at the, the individual components, this is what it looks like. Both x and y components are scaled by the same amount. Uh, but if I want to do some non-uniform scale, now in x and y directions, I'm not scaling the same amount. Let's say I scale in the x direction first, um, and then I, I'm going to scale down in y direction, right? So this is my uh, total scale operation, uh, so p to p prime. Uh, in this case, we call this non-uniform scale because we're not, I'm not scaling the same amount. Uh, and here, I can't quite write it as an equation like this because I don't have a single scaling factor. So this is, this is not going to work. But I can still write it like this, right? I can still write it as individual components. And now x and y are scaled by different amounts. Simple enough. Super simple. Right? Nothing complicated. Let's move on. Let's move on to rotation. In rotation, we're taking an object and we're rotating it, obviously. So from... The perspective of a vector is going to be like, this is my input vector, and I'm rotating it, and this is the vector I get. So uh, what I did here is just I uh, just rotated by some angle, let's call it theta. All right? Uh, so let's see what, this, what the equation for this looks like. So now this looks a little bit more complicated, right? So it, is, it is going to be just a little bit more complicated, but not much. Uh, so let's start with this input vector. Um, to see what the equation for this rotation could be. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to represent this vector as a sum of its uh, vertical and horizontal components. It's a component along x and it's component along y. So this is it's a component along x and the other one is its component along y. So basically my input vector is a sum of these two vectors. Right? Basic. I mean, this is super simple. Right? It's an x coordinate, y coordinate. That's what it is. Yeah. So the interesting bit here is that when I rotate this vector, um, I can rotate these x and y coordinates together with it. Right? If I rotate all of these, these three vectors together, this is what it looks like. Right? So basically, um, let's take a look at this, this x component only uh, for the time being. Uh, and what, what happened here is that this x component I ended up rotating it by the same, same angle. So what happened to this, this vector? 
Well, its length is still this is still is still the same. It was px that was its length, and it is still px, right? Because I just rotated it. Um, so how can I find its coordinates? Well, it's relatively easy, right? So the its x coordinate is going to be px cosine theta. Its y coordinate is going to be px sine theta. And why is that? It's because of this uh, uh, trigonometric identity. For a triangle with angle theta, I'm going to have one edge is cosine theta length, the other edge is going to be um, sine theta length. Simple enough? Yeah, that, that's where it's coming from. All right. So this was our um, x component. So if I, uh, so I can actually write this, this resulting vector as this. So px times, px is the magnitude, times cosine theta, sine theta, vector that's the direction good so that's our that's just this, this vector so we, we also have this other vector remember the other component the y component that's also rotated well it's rotated similarly not quite exactly uh, in this case um, the what the, the the angles come out as what the, the values for x and y come out as minus sine theta and cosine theta and if you look at it, it's, its x component over here is negative, so it's going to be minus sine theta right here, right? Minus sine theta. And its y component is going to be cosine theta. All right, so this is the other vector. So if I add these two things up together, that should form my resulting rotated vector, right? So basically, this is my rotation equation. I can just... Uh, uh, I can just look at my initial vector, that was p, and I take its x and y uh, coordinate values, and I multiply them by these, these vectors, and I add them together, that's going to be my rotation. Simple enough, right? Here's our rotation formulation. And now, this, is, this looks a little bit ugly to write it like this. There's a simpler way of writing this. Uh, in the form of a matrix. It's writing, I'm writing the same equation in the form of a matrix. Uh, so I put px and py over here uh, as one vector, and what I'm multiplying them by is this, this matrix. So this equation at the bottom here is exactly the same thing as the equation at the top here, right? Same thing, nothing complicated. Now, um, Here's the thing, I intentionally picked this rotation to be counterclockwise rotation. Um, sometimes people prefer using clockwise rotation. Well, if it's clockwise rotation, then the rotation angle is going to be negative theta, right? It's going to be the opposite of that. So that's the notation that's used in the book, so let's, um, let's be faithful to that. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, take these and uh, write in uh, sorry, re replace them. So we're rotating from here to here now in clockwise direction. So this minus sign went over here uh, effectively because this, this theta became minus theta effectively. Right? So this is the equation you'll see in the book. If you see the other one, the minus sign is over here, not over there. It's going to be the uh, uh, counterclockwise rotation matrix. Uh, that's basically the same thing. All right, so this, can I write this as like a vector equation? I can't quite write it as a pure vector equation, but I can write it as a vector and matrix equation, obviously. <laughs> that, that, that was, this is my resulting vector, this is my rotation matrix, and this is my uh, initial uh, vector. So, rotation matrix, there it is. We're gonna, so we're going to be doing rotations using matrices because that just uh, makes the notation quite simpler. Now, let's talk a little bit about rotation matrices because they're actually very, very interesting. Rotation matrices are orthogonal matrices. So if you haven't heard about orthogonal matrices before, it's a, a very simple concept, really. An orthogonal matrix is going to have, um, if you look at these columns, each column, uh, you will see that these columns form two vectors, and these two vectors are going to be perpendicular to each other in, in 2D. In a 2 by 2 um, orthogonal matrix, 
these two vectors are going to be perpendicular. Also, these two vectors are going to be perpendicular. So if you look at uh, horizontal vectors, they are also going to be perpendicular. But if you look at vertical vectors, and they're going to be perpendicular as well. And there's, a, there's actually a good reason for that. The rotation becomes an orthogonal, um, orthogonal matrix. So if you, if you remember what we did, we, we took this initial vector and we separated it into two components, right? So I had this uh, x component and y component. Now when I rotated them, this x component is going to be perpendicular to the y component, right? It was perpendicular before. After I rotate it, they're still going to be perpendicular. And remember, so this is the direction over here, this one. And the other one is the direction that's, that's over here, this one. So obviously, they have to be perpendicular to each other by, by design. So that's the reason why um, that's you know, one way to explain why uh, rotation matrices are uh, orthogonal matrices. And this is an important concept because orthogonal matrices have some very, very interesting and nice properties. The nice property here is that the inverse of an orthogonal matrix, the matrix inverse, is just its transpose. So if you just do the transpose of a rotation matrix, you get its inverse. So it's just basically writing the same thing here. It's the rotation matrix multiplied by its transpose. Uh, it's going to give you an identity matrix. That means it's its inverse. And um, that's also very easy to understand here if you look at this. Uh, so that it's, its transpose is the same amount of rotation with negative theta. Right? If I put negative theta over here, uh, uh, if I just take, take this theta and make it negative theta, I'm going to get this matrix, right? Because uh, negative sign, cosine is going to just uh, <laughs> destroy that negative sign. Uh, and sine is going to be, uh, sine negative theta is going to be negative sine theta, right? So if I rotate something and rotate in the opposite direction, of course, I'm going to get back to doing nothing, which is the identity matrix. Uh, and that's why its transpose turns out to be uh, it's inverse. And that's a very, very important property. I want you to remember this. This is going to come up and it's going to be very, very important. Uh, orthogonal matrices have this very nice property uh, that, that their transpose is going to be their inverse and rotation matrices are orthogonal matrices. Uh, although I should mention this, not all orthogonal matrices are rotation matrices. There is one more little uh, trick to it. Uh, orthogonal matrices in, in, will involve rotation matrices and also reflection. So they may include reflection as well. So what I mean by that is, of course, this is rotation in 2D and reflection is going to be this, right? I, I just flipped it over. Uh, and you know, you can think of this, this, this um, reflection as the um, rotation in a higher dimension. Like if, if this were in 3D, I'm just rotating in this way. Uh, so, in some ways, it is like rotation, but in a higher dimension. So, orthogonal matrices will include all of this stuff, uh, not just rotations. Right. But uh, it's, it's, it's okay to think about you know, orthogonal matrices as um, rotation matrices. Um, it's pretty close. Uh, so, this was rotation. We basically said that for rotation operation, I can write it as a matrix, which is good. Um, Hmm, okay. Well, can I do the same for scale? Turns out I can. So this non-uniform scale, I had to write it in some strange way, but I don't have to write it in that strange way. Uh, I can actually write it as like a, in a matrix form like this. Um, and, and in this case, this is the same thing as what I wrote before, right? Um, so th this matrix equation is the same thing as this equation. I'm scaling the x and y coordinates with different values. Um, so going back to scale, I, if I write it like a scale matrix here, I can use it in like matrix operation like this, like, and good. I have my scale operation, non-uniform scale, also represented as a matrix multiplication, which is pretty nice. And these are very, very simple matrices. They're going to be diagonal matrices. So that means all non-zero values are going to be along the diagonal. Um, and they don't have to be the same value. Uh, they can be different values to represent non-uniform scale and super simple matrices. 
All right, you can say, why do I care? <laughs> Let me bring back skew to explain why do you care about representing scale as a matrix. Now, we said this, this skew operation was what? A uh, rotation first, right? And then some uh, non-uniform scale, and then some rotation back, right? So I can write this as a um, matrix equation like this. So I have my initial vector multiplied by my first rotation matrix, and then the resulting vector is multiplied by the scale matrix, and then the resulting vector is multiplied by the rotation matrix, right? So I can transform everything like this, or I can just combine all of these matrices together. I can multiply them together to, to form the, the result, and this multiplied result is going to be just one matrix, right? So I can actually form a skew matrix, a matrix that will do the skew operation as a combination of rotation, scale, and another rotation. So that would be my just one matrix that will do my skew operation. And this is not actually, this is not specific to skew. Um, any two by two matrix that you can come up with, just randomly generate some values for a two by two matrix. You can represent it as a rotation scale and another rotation. It's not very specific to scale. Um, that's why these rotation and scale are really fundamental operations using uh, in 2D. Um, although there's a little bit of asterisk here, uh, because uh, this doesn't have to be strictly speaking rotation. So uh, you can take any two by two matrix and apply what we call um, singular value decomposition. It's an operation that takes a matrix and separates it into these three matrices. Uh, I'm not going to explain you how to do singular value decomposition. That's not very important for, for this course. Uh, but I would like you to know that it exists. You can actually do this. You can take a matrix and apply a singular value decomposition. And when you do that, you get three matrices out of it. And two of these three matrices are orthogonal matrices. Now, they don't have to be rotation matrices, so they can include reflections in them. But you can think of them as rotation matrices. And uh, the matrix in the middle is going to be a diagonal matrix. That's going to be a scale matrix. Right? So it's um, you know, good to know that any kind of transformation I can do with rotation and scale or, or in, with a two by two matrix, any kind of transformation I can do with a two by two matrix, I can sort of represent it as a rotation scale rotation. Um, but um, though this is not specific to 2D actually, it's, it generalizes to any matrix. It doesn't even have to be a square matrix. Uh, I can apply singular value decomposition to any matrix. Uh, and you get a orthogonal matrix uh, that's going to be square orthogonal matrix, diagonal matrix, and another uh, actually non uh, rectangular diagonal matrix, and uh, another uh, square orthogonal matrix out of that. So, singular value decomposition is a lot more general than 2v2 matrices, but you know, that, that, that's what it does for us. Well, you know, what is actually important here is not the fact that. I can take any sort of two by two matrix and decompose it into these three uh, operations. What is really, really important here is that I can take any series of rotation and scale applied in any order, and I can convert that into just one transformation matrix, right? So I can rotate, scale, and then rotate again, and then rotate again, and then scale, and then you know, whatever I do, like all these stuff. And, and all of this, the result of all that operation becomes one transformation. Just a single transformation becomes a single matrix. It's just a single two by two matrix that does all of this stuff for us. And that's going to be important because we're going to be doing, when, when we're uh, moving things around, we're going to be applying all sorts of operations. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's good to represent everything using a single matrix. Well, you might say that, well, there's something important that's missing here, right? What is that? Something very, very important that's missing here. Super important. That's translation. What happened to translation? Yeah, I mean, if I'm going to build a scene, I'm going to move things around. I can't do that without translation. It's kind of important, right? Okay, so let's try doing this. First attempt. Um, I'm going to add... I'm going to do the rotation and scale with a matrix, and then I'm going to do the translation. 
Okay, but what if I want to rotate after I translate? Okay, I can rotate after I translate. I do another rotation scale matrix, whatever, after I translate. But what if I want to translate it again after that? Well, then I'm going <laughs> to another one. All right, this, this is getting messy. I'm not liking this, right? This, this is looking quite messy, and I really don't want to do that. And you may think, like, why would I care? Like, who would want to translate and rotate and translate again? Well, it's, it's actually a very fundamental operation. Let me tell you why. So here's the reason why I want to combine rotations and, and translation. So if I take this, this cube and I rotate it, um, you know, it might rotate like this. And it's going to rotate around the origin point, whatever that is. Let's say the origin is at this corner. So rotation is going to, when I apply the rotation, it's going to rotate around the origin. But if I want to take this object and I want to rotate it around its center, how do I do that? Well, here's how I do it. First, I apply a translation. I move its center to the origin by this translation. And then I apply my rotation. And then I translate it back to, to where it was. And there it is. So I ended up rotating it around its center. So to be able to do a rotation around any point in the 2D space, I'm going to have to combine translation and rotation together. And it would be nice to have one matrix that does that for me, right? Instead of doing this, you know, translate and then rotate and translate again. That's kind of messy. Uh, so that brings us to homogeneous coordinates. Now, um, this term sounds like, oh, something quite complicated. But it's actually a super simple, super easy trick. And it's going to allow us to represent uh, translations as a part of our matrices. So here's the problem. I want to be able to do a translation. This is what I want to do, right? I want to add some translation to my vector and get the resulting vector. And I want to be able to do this using some matrix algebra like this. So I want to have a translation matrix, whatever that is, we don't know yet. And I want to multiply my vector with that translation matrix to get my stuff. Well, here's the thing. There is no matrix that would actually do this, right? I, I can't just take this and convert it to some magical matrix operation. It's just no matrix exists to do this for me. Because this is not multiplication. This is addition. The addition is supposed to be something simpler, but it's not matrix multiplication. I can't do that. So what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to cheat here. Here's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to cheat. So what I'm going to do to be able to do this addition in the context of multiplication, I'm going to cheat and add one more coordinate to my vector. Aha! Now I have one more coordinate. And if I have one more coordinate, I can just write a matrix like this. So you see, this part of the matrix is identity matrix, right? So it's not going to change anything. And this part of the matrix is going to be multiplied by 1 and added to these components. Right? By just adding this 1, I could get this lovely matrix that will do this simple operation for me. Excellent. Right? Now, okay, uh, now I have a two by three matrix, which is, no, I'm not liking that. And it would be nice, like, so this is what we call homogeneous coordinates, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this. So basically, I'm adding an extra coordinate uh, so that I can do addition by, and make addition look like matrix multiplication. Uh, so if I'm going to be using homogeneous coordinates here, I should be getting homogeneous coordinates on the other end as well. So that's, I'm going to convert my matrix to a three by three matrix. Now, look at this last row. This is a very, very trivial row. It says, I don't care, I don't care, one. So this, this uh, bottom row of the matrix is always going to be zero, zero, one. Always, not quite, we're going to fiddle with it la later, but don't worry about it for the time being. For today, we're going to assume that this bottom row is always going to be zero, zero, one. Right, uh, because I don't want to change this. It start, you know, I start with one here, and uh, the bottom row is still going to be one over there. So I would like this bottom row to be zero zero one. All right. So what did I do? 
I basically added this extra coordinate, and I'm calling this homogeneous coordinates. Uh, and by doing that, I managed to represent my translation as a form of matrix multiplication. So I basically made the math more complicated than it was. <laughs> it was a simple addition. I turned it into something a bit more complicated. And the reason why I'm doing that is because now I can do this. Now I can take any series of transformations, any affine transformation, translation, rotation, scale, and in any order, and I can combine all of that into just one matrix. Now, when I hit this matrix, that's going to define my entire transformation. And my transformation can be a string of rotations and scales and, and translation. I don't care what it is. This one matrix, one three by three matrix, is going to represent the result of that entire transformation for me, uh, which is a very, very, very useful operation in computer graphics. And we're going to use that a lot. And the resulting matrix will look like something like this. So the bottom row is going to be 0, 0, 1, because you know, this is where I cheat, and I don't care about this row, <laughs> right? Uh, so this, this bottom row is always going to be like this. Uh, OK, for the time being, it's always going to be like this. Now, these two components are going to represent the ultimate, the final resulting uh, translation. And these two by two components, A, B, C, D here, they're going to represent the rotation and scale component, the resulting rotation and scale component. Right? Again, now it's very important for you guys to understand this part, and it's going to be related to the project. So I'm repeating this. This is my resulting translation. Now, my the way I get there, maybe I did a whole bunch of translations and rotations or whatever. It might be complicated, but my ultimate um, the, the, the resulting translation out of all these uh, complicated operations is going to be just this E and F. That's going to be my resulting final uh, translation. And A, B, C, D here is just going to be representing my combined rotation and scale matrix. Okay? So, there you have it. This is... Um, we did this. We even... Uh, the um, homogeneous coordinates, and now we can do stuff like this, right? We can just take our objects and translate them, rotate them, scale them, however we want, and we can do any uh, any uh, combination of these and build our scenes. So that that's great. And the nice thing is that you know I can take my um, chairs and put them around my table, and then I can take this table and chair combination and move them together somewhere. So basically, I, I first ended up placing my chair to, next to a table, and then I moved that table and chair somewhere else. So basically, I'm applying multiple trans transformations, um, translation, rotation, scale. And in the end, this whole thing boils down into a single transformation matrix. Whew. All right. So these are affine transformations. Yay. Um, very fundamental stuff. So, but let's let's look at them some more. I would really like you all to, to understand this, this thing really well. So um, when well, I'm gonna uh, so there, there are different ways of thinking about transformations, and I I don't want you to, to get confused about this. Uh, so you can think of this like I have this vector. Uh, of course, I need to have a coordinate frame first. So I have this this vector, and I'm by applying some transformation. I'm changing this vector to something else. So you can think about transformation like this. Um, but um, there's another way of thinking about this. So I can say that, hey, I have, I have this point in space, and I have a vector in this, in this coordinate frame. I have a vector that represents this position. Now, I'm interested in this position, but I would like to represent this position from, let's say, a different coordinate frame. This is the other coordinate frame. And I'm, I, I, I'm still, I want to represent this very position, and I know where it is in this coordinate frame. I would like to know what it is in this coordinate frame, right? So I would like to know this vector. So you can think about transformation 
as a way of transforming the coordinate frame. And it's going to be exactly the same thing, right? So this, this vector and this vector, those are, this, this is the same vector. But this, the only difference is conceptual. You can think about this as I took my vector and I deformed it, or you can think about this as I'm still representing the same point, but from a different, different viewpoint, from a different uh, coordinate frame. Right? These are the same thing. So again, I can think of this as I had an object like this, and I just you know, moved and translated and rotated and scaled, whatever. Uh, I transformed this object to a, to a different location. Or, or I can think of this as, well, here, here's, here was my object, and I would like to know where that object is from a different perspective, from a different coordinate frame. Right? So these are exactly the same things. It's just that you know different way of think, different ways of thinking uh, of the uh, exact exact same thing. Well, this is like uh, you. It's it's relativity, right? It's the uh, same thing as I'm moving in a car. Uh, is it me that's moving or is it the street that's moving? From my perspective, the street is moving. <laughs> From everybody else's perspective, the car is moving. I'm moving in the car, right? It's uh, basically the same thing. The, what's happening is exactly the same. It's, it's just your, your perspective is different. Uh, here's another important thing before I conclude. This is, here's another very, very important thing. Um, so I can represent positions and directions and I can handle them uh, within the same in the same uh, umbrella. So if I'm interested in a position, like th this, this position over here, and I would like to know that position from a different coordinate frame, um, I would like to get this vector, right? But we said vectors can represent positions, they can also represent directions. But what if this vector did not represent a position, it actually represented a direction? If it represented a direction, this is not the vector I want to get out of this, right? I would like to get a vector that is actually in the same direction. This is the vector that I would like. I would like to have a transformation that will give me this, not that, right? Uh, turns out homogeneous coordinates will help me do this very, very easily. So. If I have a vector that represents a position, we saw that we can do this representation with um, homogeneous coordinates. I multiply by my resulting transformation matrix, whatever that is, and I got the result, right? This is what we've been doing. Now, if my vector, if my vector represents a direction, what I would like to do is that I would like to get rid of this translation here, the resulting translation. Because I don't want to translate my vector. I don't want to translate my position. Uh, I just want to rotate and, and non-uniformly scale. Or, like I, I would like to apply this part. That, that part is important. I don't care about the translation part because you know, that translation is going to change the vector direction. And I don't want that. All right? So the way to do that is very simple. If I have a direction vector, instead of putting one here, I'm just going to put zero. And if I put zero here, I'm going to get zero out of there, obviously. Uh, and it's just going to ignore this, this resulting translation component. So I can use exactly the same transformation matrix to transform vectors that represent positions and vectors that represent directions. Uh, and I won't have to change my transformation matrix at all. And my vectors that represent positions will look like this. They will have a one over here. And after the transformation, they will look like, they will still look like vectors that represent um, translation, no, sorry, positions. Uh, if my vectors that represent directions will have zero over here, and after the transformation, they will still have this zero component, and they will still look like vectors that represent um, directions. And that is the, the reason for this sort of funny wording here, calling this homogeneous coordinates. It's homogeneous that it, it sort of encapsulates all of the things that we want to do. 
uh, all of the affine transformations and the two different types of vectors we have, position vectors and direction vectors. So everything is homogeneously <laughs> contained in this, in this one form. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to get. Now, this is what we get for uh, transformations in, in 2D. Now, um, I don't want to get into transformations in, in 3D today. Uh, so this is uh, where I'm going to stop. Uh, and next time we're going to talk about transformations in, in 3D.